The greatest teachers offer insight on how to incorporate development in the mind, body, and spirit. Tim Anson is a leader that incorporates all three of these aspects as he mentors and assists athletes. He has trained some of the greatest athletes in the world and is one of the best human beings you will come across. This is a really long episode and probably the longest one we've had to date, but I highly recommend tuning into the whole thing. Tim offers amazing wisdom and his authenticity will be evident throughout the conversation. Thanks for tuning in and enjoy the flow. What is this, flavorings or something? We got some oils in here. Okay. And we actually got some eucalyptus. We got some uh, lemongrass. I put a little bit on the mic. That's been kind okay. of my, my signature. Is this like uh, uh, like, like the essential oils that people put on them on themselves? Yeah, you uh, can put it on if you want. Let me see here we got here. My favorite's this one, that's the lemongrass. Too, that's a little too strong. That smells like medicine. Let me see. Let me see. Let me try the next one. <laughs> <laughs> that's a little peppermint. That's too feminine. <laughs> I'll go for this one. Hating on the oils. Yeah, yeah. yeah. First guy to hate on the oils. Does it? <laughs> no, it does. It does. You know, sense actually change your mood. Oh, for sure. Yeah, that's why that's I, I like we, to have it a little bit. And I got we, some stones, you know, around the office. Try to, try to keep a. That's not bad. i in here. That's not bad. I like that. <laughs> smells, smells good, man. It's strong. I mean, <laughs> yeah. That's how. We, that's how we get our deja vu's is through scent. There you go. Sometimes you think it's I the environment it. that you're in, but it's just a scent that in a, in a breeze, and then you'll get a, it a click on a memory bank. Yeah, and that's I, that's yeah. something that I think is is very important to note. Yeah. Is like how to change your senses. Yeah, yeah. And oh, I yeah. feel like we talked about that last time I came in and trained yeah. with you. You're yes. like, bro, some people just need to work out yeah. and work through their yeah. the things that they're dealing with. Yeah. Versus just sitting at home and not oh. doing anything. You so, know, the, the the worst thing you can do is to to let things build up. Mm. Um, human beings are very physical. Uh, we don't give ourselves enough credit for that. If you think yeah. about our, our where we started from, you, we came out of Africa and walked all the way through Europe, through through Mongolia, through the Bering Land Bridge into the North America, all the way to the Strait of Magellan. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, so we're looking at from the Strait of uh, the Cape of, of Good Hope, mm-hmm. all the way to the Strait of Magellan. You know, through the continents, and so we did that physically. Yeah. And so uh, human beings are not meant to sit around and, 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 and if you sit around too much, your body becomes toxic, your mind becomes toxic. Movement has always been a foundation of, of, of human beings' ability to, to open themselves up mentally, spiritually, socially, the whole nine. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you've had quite the journey. I, the, the, I think the second time I trained with you, we got to talking a little bit about, you know, where you grew up and yeah. how you ended up you know, at Wazoo yeah, yeah. and running track, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, I ran um, track out there, yeah. So man. it'd be great to hear just a little bit of your backstory of how oh, did man. you got to where you are. Oh, wow, man. It's, uh, when you, I'm 50, I'll be 54 uh, next week. Mm-hmm. And so when you're living, uh, you know, living life to the fullest, um, you know, I look back at my life right now, and uh, I've, I've, I've lived many, many lifetimes. Um, I, d- I go through drills once in a while where I'll just sit there and meditate, and I'll take myself to places in my past hmm. you know one of the drills i do is uh yeah, we moved a lot when i was a kid so yeah. I'll, I'll go through every one of my homes wow you know and i'll just walk through from like three years old what all, does that do for up. you um it calms me down it relaxes me it helps me get connected with my past um it helps me appreciate my present hmm. and helps me you know as far as knowing that you know i can't you can't you know there's there's three types of people there's people that's that spend too much time in the past yeah there's people that are always at the present. They don't think about the past or the future. They just exist. Yeah. And you got people that just always focus on, you know, anxiety, trying to trying to trying to drive themselves to their toward their future. And those three people that stuck in those little places, I, in my opinion, sometimes get stuck. Hmm. You know what I mean? Um, you know, I went to a funeral not too long ago, and a lot of people came together from my past, and you can see some people are still stuck. They yeah. still see you as that person. Yeah, that yeah, they knew yeah. when you were 15 years not old. Wearing diapers now I'm 54 anymore. years old. Yeah. So, you know, you know, we, you're talking about to have the same conversation. Yeah. No, we, you know, what, what have you done since then? Yeah. Then you how got have people you cultivated? that, yeah. How, there's people that are just living to, for the now. Yeah. And you got people that are living for the future. Uh huh. I'm kind of a person that kind of was always a driver toward yeah. my future. Yeah. And I reflect on my past and stuff because it had an Im- impact on me where I'm at right now. For sure. But sometimes you get so caught up in in driving forward that you forget about 
and not appreciate what's in front of you yeah. and what's 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 what what allows you to be where you're at in the first place. For sure. So I've learned to kind of spread that out yeah. for me personally. To find that balance. I think I don't know if I'm answering your question, but but when I do that drill, yeah. Um, it helps me uh to to you know, it's like self analyzing yourself as far as your past. So I'll walk into the you know, it's it's there's different forms of meditation. Mm-hmm. One of my one of my meditations is that. Another meditation is, is I go for for a ride on my cycle and I go out for 50, 60 miles and I'm breathing, letting the wind blow in my face. Um, in those my heart is again. beating at a certain, I got a certain rhythm. Then all of a sudden you lose yourself. Yeah. And then when you lose yourself, when no, time doesn't exist anymore, then you start to contemplate and reflect and you start to go through conversations you have with people and it helps it helps balance yourself out in your environment. That makes any sense. When you, yeah, when you're on those bike rides, are you putting you're not putting any goal on it, right? You're not putting any outcome. It's more just like you're immersing yourself in those senses and the trees and yeah, I mean, what it's, you see. It's, 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 you know, it's, it's a form meditation, you know, I, um, not to, not to jump around, but I'm not, I'm not training necessarily for my looks Yeah. or for, you know, health is, is comes with the equation. But for me, it's, it's more of, of getting balanced mentally. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, because I think if I'm able to purge myself, get mm-hmm. rid of all the toxic stuff in my mind and in my body, then I'm become a, I'm a, like a brand new sponge. I can soak up Love that. Yeah. positive things yeah. from people. Um, when I'm spending time with my family, when I'm spending time with my friends, with my clients, people out in the public, mm-hmm. um, I'm more at, 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 at I'm, I'm that person that's at ease. Yeah. Where I can look you in the eye, yeah. we can have a conversation, and I'm able to step back and take the time to really appreciate what's around me. Yeah, and a lot of people are always in a rush. Mm, they're in a, you know, they're in a bus. Yeah, they're just moving 100 miles an hour, and I'm the kind of person that wants to get outside the bus and walk in the grass and jump in the water and breathe the air, climb the mountain, that kind of thing. So, uh, I just want to appreciate life because I know that life is short. For sure, you know what I mean. For sure. Um, going back to that drill, going through the homes and whatnot. Yeah. I walk through. I mean, I'm, I'm really good at it because I asked my mother certain things about certain places we lived. Yeah. And I'm right on. I'm right on. Yeah. So I'll walk in. I'll go to the kitchen. I will open up the cabinets. I look in the sink. I know where all the dishes are. I know there's, a, you know, I, like in, when I was in military base, I know I was probably three years old, but I know exactly where the door was. I know where the garage door was. I want to walk in the house. I see two entryways into the living room. There's another hallway that takes me into one room here. There's a closet here where there's washer and dryer. So I'm walking through the house. And I'll know where the back door, sliding glass door is, and then I go to the next home, and I do the exact same thing to every single house, to the house that I live in today. Wow. That makes any sense? Yeah, yeah. And for me, it's just, it uh, it helps me. I never want to forget where I came from because I'm really happy to be here. Mm. You know what I'm saying? You yeah. know, and, you know, I grew up, my early life was kind of, it was a bit toxic. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? My dad was three tours in Vietnam. He was in the military, and everybody was sick. So back in those days, they didn't really want to take care of it. It cost money to take care of people. So it's like it's better just to get them dishonorable discharge or honorable discharge and boot them out the military. Mm. So he's one of those guys that, you know, he was sick. I remember one time I was driving a car with him. He went to a bar, left me in the car with my dog. Uh, he was in the, in the bar probably for a couple of hours, came out, got in the car. We start rolling. And I remember him running to a telephone pole, just blasted in a telephone pole in the neighborhood. And uh, I remember his head went through the windshield, and he turned around, and he was bleeding. My dog opened up my car. My dog ran out the car. I was like maybe three or four, four probably four years old. Jeez. Dog ran out the car. I went to go chase my dog, and, and as I chased my dog, I, I, I fell over on my face because my leg wasn't working. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. That blew, blew up my knee or whatever, you know, you know in, the, in that car accident. And so uh, that was like the start of, of just stuff going downhill. And then at, at that point, we were out. He was out the military within a month or so. And so we're now we're out in the street. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And he's got two kids. He's got a wife. And he's sick. He needs some mental help. He's got PTSD. And we had to I had to deal with that for my first ten years of life, man. Wow. <laughs> wow. You know that's called toxic stress. That's insane. You know man. what I'm saying? And so, did you use sports? Because you eventually got to Wazoo. Did you use? No, I mean, your here's how that how's, how's that work, man. You you bounce around a little bit. You you move a lot. You deal with you know you, you know. Uh, I was an angry kid because I was dealing with, I was dealing with the brunt of physical abuse mm. uh, from my father, which I loved him to death. Can you imagine loving your father? Yeah. To death, 
thinking he's, a, he's the greatest guy in the world, nicest guy in the world, wonderful. I mean, you take, I took, I took after my father. He's basically, uh, he spit me out. But he was, he, he had to go. He fought in that war. And he had to deal with a lot of the other stuff that I hadn't, didn't have to deal with. Yeah. And so he was sick. So when he, the way he would temper that sickness that he had was he had to drink. So when he drank, he became a different person. He became that killer. Yeah. If that makes any sense. Yeah. So anytime he saw my, he saw, he saw me and him. So anytime, and he didn't feel good about himself. He had a lot of shame, a lot of guilt about what he, what he went through. So anytime that I was a little off or he was a little off, I'm, I was the one that had to take the brunt of that. Mm. That makes any sense? Mm -hmm. So I, I, I walked around really angry for, for a long time when I was a kid. And so, you know, I wasn't afraid of nobody. So I used to fight constantly. I was always fighting. And we can go on from that, but but as you as as I got older I understood that, you know, it's not it's not very healthy to be this way. And whatever I'm gone through, whatever I'm going through is not my fault. Mm -hmm. I just kinda some kids understand certain things. Some some kids have an innateness about them. You know, you go to Brazil, you go to S S Vietnam or wherever, you go to some place, you see a kid walking out in the street and you who's your parents at? I don't have no parents. You know, uh, what are you doing? I mean, how how are you surviving? I'm surviving, you know. Um, you get street kids. So I became like a street kid almost, but I learned how to, I just understood that whatever I was going through was not my fault. I'm not going to absorb any of this stuff. I'm going to deal with it. But I'm going to, you, know, you know, my school became a sanctuary for me. You know, some of the best food I had to eat a whole day was school lunch. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, I was a, I was a kid of the community. This, this, this community started to raise me, if that makes any sense. Yeah. And I didn't get into sports until... I mean, most of these kids nowadays, I mean, even back then, they would get into sports a lot early. I got into sports around 12 years old. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And sports became, for me, an outlet for me to, because, you know, when you deal with toxic stress as a kid, you become, you start to bring everything in, you bring it inside, and you hold it in, and you become real shy. You don't want to look at people in the eye. If somebody touches you the wrong way or looks at you the wrong way, you just blow up on them. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So I was destined if I didn't correct all those things, that I was gonna destined to, 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 to be in prison or be in a juvenile system. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so I said, hey, I got I gotta go out here and I gotta do I got When did you become aware of that? Like, hey, I gotta I got, change. I got aware of that when I got an ass kicking. Mm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I got in a fight and and with a with a guy and this 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 uh he ended up becoming an all state wrestler. He's like <laughs> he was a couple years older than me, he walks up to me, he's like, you know, you wanna fight me? I said, I got you too. And so we started fighting, and, and uh, you know he, he he went under me and grabbed my legs and lifted me up and body slammed me on the on the on the pavement. It was like twenty people out there watching the whole fight. I hit the ground, and we you know he had me on lockdown like an MMA fight. <laughs> and then he had his arm around me, and all of a sudden he kept grabbing my nose and squeezing it as hard as he could. <laughs> and then he would just slam his fist in my nose well, as, as, as he was squeezing in my nose. He would squeeze my nose and slam his fist in my nose and squeeze it and slam it again and just started, you know, about the fifth punch, I saw him back off and I seen all the 20 people that were screaming and hollering watching the fight back off. I'm like, why is everybody backing off? What's going on? And, and, uh, and I see a stream of blood shooting out the side of my, my eyes. I could see it shooting out. That was coming from me. I thought somebody opened up a can of soda or something. But it was my nose. It, it, it wasn't bleeding from the inside. It was bleeding from the outside. He hit something up in here in my nose, and my nose was just shooting out blood everywhere. And it was getting all over my clothes and everything. And people were, you say, I'm, you know, it's like, he looks at me, he's like, you're done, dude. I said, I am done. Let me go home. <laughs> so I went home, and, you know, my mother, you know, she, she opened the door and saw all this blood all over me. You know, she said, you know, take these clothes in the backyard, throw them in the garbage, you know, wash yourself up real good and go eat some dinner. That's how, that's how things were handled back then. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so, at that point, that was the first. I mean, I was I was considered. I felt in my life at that age, there was no there was no kid in the in the world that can beat me in a fight. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Because if you deal with a with a grown man who's six foot three that weighs 215 pounds beating your ass, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Then you're not afraid of no kid. I don't care if it's a teenager. You ain't kidding. You ain't scared of nobody, especially somebody who was muscular and strong, who was a Vietnam vet, the whole nine, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So I wasn't scared of nobody. So, But it's at, when I got my first butt kicking, it woke me up a little bit. It woke me up saying that, you know, I didn't know what the word bully was, but I knew that I was being a bully. I was out of line. At the same time, maybe I could have got killed this time. 
you know, maybe something could have terribly terrible could have happened to me. I busted my nose. I had I was covered in blood everywhere, but I didn't die. You know what I'm saying? So it's like I can't continue to, to live like this. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So I got to clean up my act. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because I, I do want to live. Uh, and so that's what changed me a bit. Because because the thing is about this guy that 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 that. You know, I, I came home and the whole neighborhood is like Tim got his butt kicked. There's no kid that can beat Tim. He beat he got his butt kicking. Even though the kid was older than me, he was a, he was a wrestler. I said nobody could believe I got a butt kicking. And so I remember walking around with the, I used to hang around with a bunch of older kids, high school kids. I was really tall as a, as a young kid. I was you know 10, 11 years old. I was tall. Most most of the kids I hung out with were you know 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 years old. So I'm walking around with a bunch of the teenagers, and here's the kid again down the street. And they said, Tim, that's the guy that kicked your butt. I said, yeah, that's the guy that kicked my butt. I said, well, it's time for you to kick his butt again. You can't go out like that. I was like, I don't want to fight him no more. I'm done. He says, if you don't fight him, you have to deal with us. Because that's how it was back in those days. So I didn't want to deal with these teenagers and be punked all the time. So I had to go take care of him. So I went to him, and he came. He said, you want some more? I said, I want some more. Let's go. So I remember when he, I, I kept, visualizing what he did to me the first time where he got under my legs and got me in a lockdown and threw me down and said, okay, he's going to do that again. If he ever does that again, I know what I'm going to do. So we were in the street. Now it was a bunch of teenagers out there, the older teenagers getting their entertainment, and he's coming at me the same way. So I back up, I kick my leg back, and I take my knee, I take the back of his neck, I grab the back of his neck, and I take it and I slam my the knee into his face. <laughs> and his head cocks back. You know, like he got whiplash, and he was halfway knocked out, and I just started pounding on him. He was, I was beating the crap out of him. And he, he started crying, and he couldn't take it no more, and he got up, and it was done. And all the older guys would pat me on the back and said, you know, good job. And I felt awful. It's like he, he didn't deserve this. And I don't deserve to be fighting like this, and this is ridiculous. This is crazy. And then a week later, I'm in school, and, and, I, and I'm sitting there at and, in, in class, and I hear somebody looking out the window say, Tim, there's somebody out in the window asking for you in school. And I look out the window, it's him. <laughs> it's like, you want, uh, you know, we got to go, we got to keep going, we got to go at it again. Uh, you come after school, meet me out in the front, we got to go again. So I got to beat down the first time I beat him the first time. Now we got to do this again? <laughs> I said, no, this is crazy. No, no more. This is no more. This is ridiculous. And as a matter of fact, you, you're not even going to school. You out here in front of this, you in middle school, and I'm in oh, junior high, and I'm in elementary school. You stand out here, you're supposed to be in school, you coming out here to fight me <laughs> at my school. It's ridiculous. So at that point, I decided, I, I ran out the back and ran home or whatever. I didn't want to deal with it no more. I said, I can't, I can't live like this. I'm, I'm, this situation in the streets, like it is here, it will never end. Some certain situations, it, it, in the neighborhoods I grew up, it wasn't the biggest guy that was the toughest guy. It was that little guy that was like five foot two, 125 pounds. That was crazy. Hmm. So this guy happened to be a bigger guy that was crazy, that would never end until it got ended. That makes any sense? Yeah. So you had to find a place to stop it. I remember meeting him again. I was at Washington State University, and I was home for a summertime, and I'm driving in my car, and I see a guy at a bus stop, and he looked familiar to me, a big old dude. So I drove up to him, and I said, hey, man, I, I recognize you. You need a ride. Where you going? He said, I'm going up here about a couple miles to get in the car. So I'm rolling, I got him in the car, I'm rolling up the hill. And I'm sitting there, I said, man, what do I know you from? I know you like I know you, like I went to school from you. And he's like, I know you too. And he's like, you Tim Manson? I go, yeah, I am. That's him, Tim. He's like, he goes, I'm Damon, man. I go, Damon, 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 Damon. Remember, remember back in the day, we used to go back and forth and just battle each other, man, and fight all the time? I said, <laughs> oh, yeah, Damon. I'm like, and my heart started skipping a little beat, you know? And, you know, this guy, now I'm, I'm six foot two, you know, 200 pounds. This cat here next to me is like six, 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 weigh about 270. Wow. Look like a defensive end in the NFL. <laughs> I'm saying, first of all, I must have been crazy even trying to think I put my hands on you. You know what I'm saying? I said, matter of fact, what are you doing right now? He said, what are you doing, man? I said, I'm over at Wazoo. I'm at the school. He said, what are you doing? He said, I just got out of prison. It's like, oh, shoot. Prison? How long you been in there? I've been there. I just got out about eight years. I was in prison. So you've been in prison for, you know, I'm in school. So you you got, what happened to you? I said, I was in Jubilee for a while, and they locked me up, and they got back out. I got in trouble again, and they put me in prison. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I just got out. So your whole life has been in jail and in prison. 
And I'm thinking, that could have been me easily. That makes any sense? Yeah. So I'm not sure if I'm asking your questions at all, but I'm just letting you no, know. No, that was a great story. Me, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, th- I think. But, you know, I just, I just learned that, you know, one thing about sports, one thing about sports in general, you know, this is, there's two things I think that brought, you know, you see all this polarization that's going on out there, all this racial crap that I see out there is ridiculous to me. But one thing that, that allowed America to become an America really was, I think, in my opinion, even though I got, you know, even though my dad went to the military, military was the first to integrate. So you had people from all different backgrounds who were able to, to work together, get to know each other, and get past race. You know what I'm saying? Another thing was sports. So you look at like the Celtics in the fifties with Bill Russell and all those guys and all this this mixed group of guys that get together that had no relationship to each other. When the Celtics had to travel back down south, there's game there's places they couldn't stay. Mm-hmm. That that Bill Russell couldn't stay at. And some of the other black players couldn't stay. And the other players would back up for him and say, Okay, we're not gonna stay at this hotel then if these if my teammates can't stay in this hotel. So we're gonna stay in this flea bag hotel, all of us together as a team. You know? And we just we just won five championships. We won six championships. Or I think Bill Russell won eleven championships. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. He, he had eleven rings and only ten fingers. You know what I mean? Yeah. From that team. So it was without sports and without the military, where would we be right now? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know. So, 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 my point is is is, is the fact it's not it's it's not about that. It's just social economics. That's what you see sometimes. You know, I grew up in a place where I didn't see race necessarily. Everybody else kind of saw, but I didn't see race, and a lot of my friends didn't see race because we was just all poor. We were so poor where I grew up, we couldn't afford we couldn't afford the OR. We were poor. We didn't even say poor; we said poor. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That means your light got cut off sometimes. Sometimes you had no food. Somebody go to a food bank. Sometimes you gotta get the government food. That kind of stuff. That makes any sense? Yeah. So, growing up from that situation to where I'm at, rise right, night and day. You know, I live next to Microsoft execs and all these other folks. I live near the plateau and Sammamish and all this other stuff. And, you know, education helped me and all that kind of, you know, but, so I look at my life, it's been many lives, many lives. You know what, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Many lives. So I'm comfortable hanging around at Bill Gates at his spot, having dinner, and I'm comfortable hanging around in the hood. You know what I'm saying? I'm comfortable, I'm com- I, my, 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 my net is cast it wide as far as my comfort level. Yeah. That makes any sense? Yeah. I I wasn't the most talented kid coming out of my area. I just worked really, really hard, and I had a certain level of innate gifts here and there. But there's so many people that I grew up with that were way more talented than me. I mean, I, I grew up in Tacoma, Washington, so we got, you know, A.B. Bradley and, you know, Isaiah Thomas, a bunch of, you know, Marcus Trufant, a bunch of, bunch of high-level athletes, but... Back in my day, we had a whole bunch of guys that were really good, and either they had too many kids, or they were on drugs, or they got caught in the wrong crowd, and got in trouble. I was lucky to, to to go through certain things down when I was younger to understand to understand myself, to understand my environment, and understand what I need to do to do better than what I than my circumstance. I didn't know what I could do or how to do it. I just know if I stuck, stuck, you know, got in the classroom and focused in my in my books every day, um, and in in sports helped me a lot. I basically at at, a, at at around 12 years old I decided to become a monk. You know what a monk is? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? A monk is somebody that I ain't trying to go no dances. I ain't trying to get nobody pregnant. I was a tall kid when I was a kid. I was a tall kid. I was, you know, when I was 10 years old, 11, everybody thought I was probably ninth grade. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? I was one of those kids that, that, that grew quicker. I didn't mature quicker. I just was tall and lanky and skinny and just and looked like a giraffe, basically. But the girls, girls 14, I'm 10, 11 years old, girls would come to me at you know, 13, 14 years old, 15, and they want to they wanna get together with me. You know what I'm saying? And I'm like, no. Can you meet me at the house tonight at my place? My parents aren't going to be home, kind of deal. <laughs> and the next morning, it's like, Tim, why didn't you come over last night? And like, because my mom said I had to do this, some chores around the house. I always make excuses. So I had to become a monk, basically, to make sure that when I got in high school, that I didn't have three kids. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? Yeah. I had to be a monk when somebody says, hey, man, why don't you try out this reefer and smoke this, this marijuana? I'm like, no, I'm not going to smoke that marijuana. 
or it had to be a monk or somebody, hey, why don't you drink some of this alcohol here, see what it feels like. I said, I'm not going to do that. I saw so many people make so many mistakes. That's all the learning I needed. I learned from negative learning. I didn't learn from some, some grown man or some grown woman come up to me and say, don't do this or do that, do that. I just knew innately what I should be doing and yeah. what I should be doing, yeah. what my priorities would be. That makes any sense? Yeah. So, and I had a teacher in seventh grade. I tell you this right now. I had a teacher because I remember in seventh grade, I came home with my report card and I had a, I had a 3.5 or something like that. And, and my, my mom looked at my report card and she's really happy. I remember my teachers being happy. My teachers looking at my report card. My science teacher actually was looking at my report card. I was loving. It. I love science. I've always loved science. So he's looking at my report card. He's like, and he, I guess he expected me to do awful, because everybody else is doing awful. So he looks at my report card. And he goes, he looks at me. He's like, this is really good, Tim. I can't believe this. This is awesome. I'm like, cool. So I, you know, show, make sure you show your mom this. I say, okay, I'll show you my mom. So I show my mom. My mom's from Germany. My mom doesn't know anything about our system. She don't know nothing about grades. She don't know nothing about college, nothing. She's, she, my mother's uh, what they call, she's a blue-collar person that grew up blue-collar in Germany. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. My mother's an African, is, is a black German. Her dad was from Mississippi, African-American, and he fell in love with my grandmother. Um, they had her, but they couldn't really c connect at any higher level because this is during World War II. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? In the 40s. So he couldn't take her home to Mississippi, you know, <laughs> and start a family. And so my mother decided, you know, she, she was born in Germany. And she was post-Nazi Germany, 1946, African, half, half black, half white. You know what I'm saying? Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, so she's looking at my report card, and, she, and she's like, this is really awesome. And so I guess after she saw my report card, she's like, I got to start thinking about college for him. So she's looking at schools and trying to research things. My mother was a seamstress. My mother made minimum wage. But she's looking at my report card, and she's like, this is great. So she's doing research, and she comes back to me one day, and she's crying. I'm like, why are you crying for, Mom? What's going on? What's happening? It's like, I'm looking at you're doing so well in the school, and you're working so hard at school, and, and, and I'm looking at colleges for you, and I can't afford college. I can't afford it. And she says, uh, um, you're not going to college. Now, they, you know, nowadays we say things a little differently, but back in those days, that's all she knew. And she looked at me, Tim, you know, we can't afford college. You're not, going to, you're not going to college. So you just might as well forget about it. Okay. So I go back to school that, that Monday, in, you know, at my science class. The same guy that, you know, looked at my program that I said I did a good job. And so I'm sitting in class, and he's, like, trying to teach a lesson, and I'm, I'm looking at... And most of the time he's teaching lesson, most of the kids around me is always talking and joking around. And I'm sitting here listening intensively to what he's saying. But I'm, sitting, I'm, I'm saying, my, my mom said I'm not going to college. Why am I working so hard? Why can't I be like the rest of these kids around here, talking and griping and, and you know, just acting a fool and not listening? And just why can't I be like that? I'm going to be like that from now on. So I sit in class and, uh, and I'm starting mouthing off. And I remember Mr. K Mr. Kinnaman was his name. I never forget his name, Mr. Kinnaman. Looked like he looked like uh, what did Mr. Kinnaman look like? <laughs> I don't know. He looked like he looked like you know he looked like uh, looked like Bill Gates, pretty okay. much. Kind of looked like Bill Gates. He's like, and he looks at me and he's like, he stops what he's saying. He's like, Tim, can you can you be quiet? I'm like oh, okay. So he starts talking again. I start rag ragging off a little bit after a while after I got comfortable, and he's like. Tim, come with me. Everybody just do with your stuff. I need you to come with me. So I, he, he takes me in the back, back, of, back of the room, and he grabs me, and he lifts me up, and he throws me against the side of the wall. He just grabs me, just boom. And back in those days, that's what they did back then, because back in my day, they always had them big old paddles sitting on the corner, and <laughs> yeah. they, you know, they sit in front of the class, in front of everybody, and get your, get your fanny <laughs> hit real hard. I'm sorry, you're hearing echoes. <laughs> So they don't do that no more. But back in the day, it was corporal punishment going on. So he grabs me, and he lifts me up, and he throws me against the wall. He goes, what the hell is wrong with you? And I start crying. I'm like, he goes, he goes, why are you acting up in my class, man? You never act up in my class. What's going, the hell is going on, man? And he's, I'm still in the air. He's holding me up in the air. And I'm going, my mom said I'm not going to college. 
So I don't need to try so hard. Why am I trying so hard? He says, is that what you, is that what's going on? I said, yeah. I got my report card. I, I, told, I sent it to my mom. It's like I told you. She looks at it, and she, and she looks at it, and she's happy. But she says, I can't, I'm not going to college. I'm not going to do anything with this education. So why am I working so hard? I can't be like everybody else, man. You know what I'm saying? And I was yeah. crying the whole time, 13 years old. And he sets me down. He says, you want to go to college, man? I said, yeah, I want to go to college, man. He says, he said, okay, here's what we're going to do. After school is over, I want you to come to my office. Come, no, come to my classroom after school is over, and we can talk about how we can get you to college. So I went back to class, went back to school in my class, went through my day. At the end of the day, I go back to his, 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 his room. We sit down, I see him at his desk. He's got this big old legal pad sitting there, you know, and there's some pens on the side. And we sit down, he sits in front of me, and he says, Tim, you want to go to college, let's map it out. Let's see how we can do this. Because I don't get too many kids that's asking me they want to go to college when they're 13 years old around here. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And you asked me for that. So I'm going to show you the map how to do it. He said, first of all, I know that you're a really good athlete. He says, I had a good reputation back then as a basketball player and all that kind of stuff back then. But he said, don't rely on that. Don't rely on that at all. You know, just go out there and, and use this as a form of release for yourself. But don't go out there and, and, and think that's going to get you to go to college. What's going to get you to college is, 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 is your academics and your, and your smarts and your intelligence. He says, he says, he starts writing down. He says, if you start now, I want you to take, he said, he said, he first, he first I, was in the, I was good at art and all, a bunch of other things, you know. He said, I don't want you to take any easy classes. I want you to take nothing but hard stuff. I need you to take science. I need you to take, take math. I need you to take English. You know how to write. So when you have your electives, when you have to get your classes, don't take no basket weaving. Don't take, don't take no, you know, just, you know, art or anything. I mean, even though I loved art and I was a really good artist, I'm still a good artist to this day, I didn't take any art. So I took nothing but harder classes. So I took, you know, I algebra, pre-calc, calculate, calculus. I had all the science classes. Anything that was science, I took it. All the writing stuff, all the college prep stuff, all that stuff as I got older. He says, if you do this right now at 13 years old, you're going to be in 8th grade, ninth grade, 10th grade. By the time you're a junior in high school, there's going to be so many op opportunities for you. You're going to have options. If you don't do these things, you're going to have no options or just maybe one option. And that, that one option, that door can slam on you. But if you do everything you're doing right now, you'll find yourself in a place where you have many, many doors that you can walk through if you want to. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So after I had that, I spent about a couple of hours with him. I came home, I became a monk. I decided to become a monk. That means when I get done with school, I get I, first thing I do when I get home is do my homework, get it all done. You know what I'm saying? I ain't going to no dances. I didn't, I wouldn't go chasing, no, you know, I, I became a monk, literally like a celibate monk. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. No drugs, no drinking, no nothing. By the time I got to 11th grade, I had Annapolis, I had West Point, I had all these different schools that were knocking on my door trying to get me into their school. And it wasn't for sports, which is crazy. When sports started coming, coming, coming created more, sports created more opportunities than opportunities I already had. Mm. I could have went to school academically, but I was able to go to school because I had, you know, and, and do my sports. You know what I'm saying? That makes some sense. Yeah. So it opened up. And I tell the kids the same thing. I work with a lot of young people right now. And they listen, I mean, after they spend a little time with me for a while, they know that I care. And then they start listening to anything that comes out of my mouth. Sometimes you more than their parents are giving them. So I sit there and I explain, this is what you, I, I'm basically Mr. Kinnaman all over again <laughs> to them. Yeah. But they're listening to me. Yeah. You know, there's some kids out there that I've worked with that were two-point students. And after I had conversations with them, they, you know, even, in, even from, they were like two-point something in high school and they go to college, now they're 3.8, 3.7, academic All-Americans. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Just out of just, just your habits and the way you look at the world and the way you look at academics and not being fearful and learn how to not just learn, not just take a test, but learn how to know the information. That, know, know the information that you can actually use, that you can talk about. Did that mm -hmm. makes any sense? Because mm -hmm. a lot of us, is, you know, we learn in different ways. And the one thing I had to learn as I got older is that it's not about taking tests. It's about learning the information so you beca becomes your own. So when you actually take a test, it's, testing is not, not, not even a big deal. 
Yeah. Because you know the information. Sometimes some of the stuff is just review. Sometimes sometimes it's just warming up your brain a little bit. But you know the information. You know you know if somebody gives you an answer, you know how to write to say the question. If somebody gives you the question, you know how to say the, give them the answer. Mm-hmm. You know how to talk about it. You know how to write about it. So that's that's something I learned as I got older. You know that's when I went to college. The same thing, but but those things you you I created those opportunities for myself. College for me, you know, when I was in college, it was like an eye opener for me because it was the first time. I mean, I went to college for one. I went to college. And I saw the athletes there. I go, this is it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because the people I grew up with, and half of them, no, no, three fourths of them didn't go anywhere. But three fourths of them could have came out here and scooted everybody out here. <laughs> I'm talking about the ones that are on a Heisman Trophy list, the whole nine. Yeah. They were that good back in the day. So you look at somebody like, I mean, you see, I see like Isaiah Thomas, for instance. There's like two or, two or three Isaiah Thomases when I grew up in my neighborhood. It was just, just like him or even better than him. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, we had Daryl Robinson. He still owns the 400 meter world, the, the 400 meter uh, national record to this day. He's 40 some years old. He ran 44, 6, 9, and 400. It's a 17 year old. Wow. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. He ran the fastest time in the, he ran the fourth fastest time in the world when he was in junior and high school. So I see. I grew up in. It, I grew up around these. We used to have track meets in the street, football games and stuff in the street. We used to, I used to man, we used to do everything. So did that answer your question? I know you got yeah, some more man. questions. No, 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 no. That was that was awesome to hear the backstory of your journey. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you talked to a couple things about um, the one time the one of the sessions I came in with you. You discussed uh, athletes like the high level athletes. They knew how to like turn it off. You know, when they when they get home, they can they can shut their system down. They're not in that you know, uh, sympathetic state, you know, when they get home, they know yeah. how to rest. And yeah. you talked about, you know, we are human beings mm-hmm. and we have that right to be a being mm-hmm. as well and to go through those things. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know if you could, obviously you train very hard and I know mm-hmm. it seems like you worked really hard to mm-hmm. get up to college, mm-hmm. but even when you're an athlete or when you're training now and when you're mentoring athletes, how do you discuss to them how to get to that being state? Yeah, or, I mean, or to not feel like they're always in that rush to nowhere. The, the, the athletes nowadays, or just people in general, are yeah. part of our society, our society right now. Um, you know, when I was a kid, or when I was a young person growing up, even in my 20s, you know, um, I went through college with no, there was no computers. Um, we had no cell phones, we had no pages, we had nothing, there was no technology at all. Yeah. We, had a, we had a landline phone, that's it. I mean, I had to call my mom uh, on Sunday night at midnight because the rates were that rates were cheaper. A lot of times you had a girlfriend when you went to college, you had to cut it off. You had to basically break up with that girlfriend yeah. if she was in your school. Yeah. Because when you saw that three hundred or four hundred dollar phone bill coming in a week on the <laughs> on the on the month, it's like you had no choice but to say, I can't this is not gonna work. Yeah. I can't write letters to you. Right. You know what I'm saying? So there was no texting. There was nothing. You know what I'm saying? So I always tell people my you know, I said, you know, things were easier for us back then. Because we had each other, we can communicate. We talk. We look at each other in the eye. Talk face to face. Um, we had a little a lot more patience. You know, I grew up in a time in my life we had no microwave ovens. You had to sit there and wait 40, 50 minutes to cook anything. You know, as far as cooking stuff. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Um, we had. I grew up with three channels on the TV. You know what I'm saying? And one independent channel. Cable TV didn't come out until you know when I was like 13 or 14 years old. We had HBO and you can watch movies other than the movie that you saw in the movie theater. You know what I mean? So things are a lot differently back then, a lot different back then. Um, now, it's very di- I mean, the the phone, the iPhone, and the computers, all that stuff, it's the social media, people have, are starting to look at it more, it's starting to infiltrate everything in their lives. It becomes their life. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just a tool. And I know it's a tool. I know I use it as a tool. And I have to check. You have to I have to check myself to make sure it don't become a life ever. How much time I spending on it? You know, just let it sit there. Let you let you, let your Facebook sit for a couple of days. Don't touch it. Let your Instagram sit for a couple of days or a week. Don't touch it. But no, you got people that are driving their car. Got to look at it. You know what I'm saying? They can't. They. It, it's. I remember when I was in high tech. This the uh, people I spoke to. They said there's gonna be a, a product. They're gonna start merging voice with data. And this big old brick phone is going to become that computer that you got. We're going to merge the voice brick phone and this computer 
and it's and it's become it's gonna become ubiquitous. I said, what's ubiquitous mean? Ubiquitous means everybody on the planet is gonna have to have it, and they can't function without it. We're gonna make it. We're gonna make it such. Because you know, why this communication started here. Why this technology started at Caroline Point in Kirkland. Hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Craig McCaw, McCaw Seller, which became AT and T. Yeah, Nextel. You had all the T-Mobile. Everything started here. So. So I, I was able, when I was in, early in my career, to spend time with those folks to explain what, what, what's in front of us right now is this, this iPhone. It's ubiquitous. You can't, we, can't walk, we can't leave the house without it. You got to take it everywhere with you. It does, every, it does everything for you. When I was like, younger, growing up, even in, my, even in my young adult life, I had nothing like that. Nothing. It was and nothing what do you think that did positively for you, or what do you think could be negative now with it? Um, what's negative now with it is that the positive thing is, 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 is it's a great tool for, to connect with people. It's a great tool to get information from. It, it's got some, you know, some apps and stuff. You can do all kinds of cool stuff mm-hmm. with it. But I think from a psychological standpoint, it's ahead of our evolution. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's, 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 it's a level of mind control, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Um, which is not good. Where people aren't getting enough sleep, they feel like they're not good enough. They're getting ang- anxiety is at a super high level in our society. Anxiety, if it go, if it overwhelms you, it makes you shut everything down. You start becoming depressed. Um, you start dealing with, you know, you start seeing, you know, teenage suicide spike up. You start seeing adult suicide spike up. Um, mental illness is at a, at a seriously high level at this point, in my opinion. You know, not, trying to keep myself on target. What I'm what I'm saying here is this, that the the social media and the Instagram and the Facebook and stuff. You gotta. There's no classes you can take. Mm-hmm. You can't go to school and say, "Here, here's what you need to do to manage all this." So it's just it's it's left to the devices of us to be able to ha- deal with it. And some of us, it's you know, I I don't think it's the demons that make us do bad things. I think it's I think it's it's uh, it's it's the environment that we're in, it's society that we're in. Um, it's 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 the environment that can cause a weak or corruptible mind to do harm to themselves and other people. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. It's not. It's not. It's not the demon. It's. 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 It's how we deal with our environment. And if your mind is not intact, you know what I'm saying. If it's weak, and you can't handle it, it makes you hurt yourself and other people. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That makes any sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I think that's why you explaining your journey when you finally decided, like, yeah. hey, this isn't my fault. Yeah. Like a lot of. I think a lot of the times we compound the issues because yeah. we're like, oh, we got to fix this. Uh-huh. Oh, this is our uh-huh. fault. Uh-huh. There is no. Uh-uh. relax being uh-uh. state but you're right like we we don't take classes to yeah. learn how to handle uh-uh. social media which uh-uh. i mean back in the day there was this funny quote uh-uh. it was like we used to have instant messenger mm-hmm. where you'd be like hey I'm, I'm i'm off now yeah and then you're off you know social media yeah. now it's just like you're always checking it you're, you're always, always on it, it. Yeah. but you that was one of the questions i had you post a lot of like a lot of wisdom on on yeah. your instagram yeah. a yeah. lot of the the stuff and you know you talk about time reality mental health a lot of different things what is the message that you try to send um to athletes or just people who follow you for me for me it's uh you know i read a lot um i spend a lot of time with people i'm a mentor i'm a teacher i'm a coach but at the same time i understand that it's all reciprocal um whatever i give to whoever i give they also they don't realize that they're giving back to me at the same time. Yeah. So if I'm somebody's therapy, you believe it, you're my therapy as well. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. If if somebody comes to me and say, "Hey, thank you, Tim," I have no, I don't hesitate to make sure that they get thanks back. And they go, "Why are you thanking me?" Because you allow me the ability to go to sleep at night. You allow me the ability to wake up in the morning to, to have something to live for. Wow. That yeah. makes any sense? Yeah, that's humbling, man. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so, I don't know, what's the, what's the question you had again? I mean, I'm, I'm Well, just, around. I mean, no, yeah. that was beautiful. Oh, oh what, the, way I write, the way I write what I write. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I told you, when I grew up as a kid, Yeah. I took nothing but science and math and everything else. I was an artist. I was an artist. I was, I'm very good at being, I'm very creative. Mm-hmm. And I have this creative urge. I mean, you you've trained with me before. Yeah. And the the strength of what I do as a trainer is is the science in my in my education. But what makes what compound what what, what amplifies that is my creativity. Yeah. My creativity. I don't throw creativity at you unless I can back it up with the science. Got you. I'm not giving you something just to show that I can give you something different. I'm giving you something that's got a, that's got I can explain to you from a scientific level. But it's very creative in the way I do things. So the athletes come to me because they don't, they don't know what to expect. 
But when they get in there and they get immersed in it, they walk away feeling great. But it's like, where do you come up with this? It's because it's 24 seven for me, it's always in my head. My mind's always working. And so I need creative outlets. I'm, I'm, I'm overflowing with creativity. So you got, you, got, you got like say a prince who made music. The music that you heard was only a portion of the music that he put out there. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? You start mm -hmm. to find that out now. You know what I'm saying? He had all this music, but he only, t he only gave us this much. Yeah. Which means that we're going to hear a whole bunch of music to the day we croak that, that that's going to be put out there and, and just, you know, just put out there you know, for his estate to let people hear some of the stuff that he's doing. Yeah. That makes any sense? Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm one of those guys that's very, very creative, and I read a lot of philosophy, religion, uh, politics, biographies. I, I read, I have a Kindle. I probably have two or three books that I read at the same time. I'm always reading. I don't even watch TV. Mm -hmm. I don't watch TV. I, it, you know, they, they say they say the average person spends two or three hours a day watching watching TV. I watch probably five minutes a day. I read. That's all I do is read, and mm -hmm. I interact with people. That's yeah, all I do. Yeah. So when I do that, things come to my head. Things 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 come to my head, and I train people, and I record stuff. A lot of the videos I have are raw. So it's basically just me, somebody with a phone, just recording what we're doing. I take the videos and I, I edit them real quick in about five or ten minutes. I'm always writing stuff in my head. I'm always, I got diaries and stuff that I talk about, things that's in my head so I can keep control of that. Because think about it. If you grow up toxic as a kid and you grow up all this, all this conflict that's going on, you got to organize that else you go mad. Yeah, that makes any sense. And you do that through your workouts and, and do that through my just workouts, my, my my meditation. Yeah. I do it through you know cycling. I do it through interacting with my people, the community, that kind of deal. And it keeps me, it keeps me in homeostasis. It keeps me balanced out. So I mean, you don't have to go too in depth on this question, but yeah. just as you discuss this, to me, it seems like you 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 know how to cope with certain things yeah. in, in a very positive way, yeah. Yeah. and you don't let kind of the external stuff make you do things that are they deem as positive like yeah. so let's say met to medicate in certain yeah. ways no no what no. is your view on just how people cope with the issues that they're going through yeah i just i think attitude is a big deal mm. i mean um i use the term it's i, I try to persuade people to be uplifting mm. and i i, I, I want to be uplifting and i want to persuade everybody around just look at things not necessarily look at things on the bright side because yeah. I think it's a weakness to be overly optimistic, uh -huh. and there's a weakness to be overly pessimistic. Yeah. Sometimes you have to kind of find the middle point and just be a realist about things, but make sure your realism is in in this in the sense is actually real. Mm -hmm. That makes any sense? Yeah. Because your realism can be can be off. Yeah. The guy that was yeah. in Man Mandalay Bay shooting at the concert goers, is he thought everything was normal. Yeah. He was not normal. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So you have, you have to always keep yourself in check. And the way you keep yourself in check is through other people, people around you that can be that you can be honest with. They can be honest with you. Mm -hmm. Don't hang around people that are saying yes, yes, yes to everything. Hang around people that that have varying and different opinions in yourself. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, you know I got friends that are Republican, Democrat, Libertarian, you know, Independent. You know, the political persuasion. I'm not gonna judge you. It's just I, I'm still gonna love you regardless. You don't have to think the same way I think. I need to be around people that think differently than me. To be yeah. honest with you, yeah, that makes any sense for sure. So, 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 the creativity in my, you know, I use a, I, I want to be, I'm going to persuade people to be uplifting. So I created a new word out of that. I call it uplift suasion. Mm. I use it all the time. It's called uplift suasion. So what does that mean? I'm trying to persuade people to be uplifting. I want you, the the, the word is uplift suasion. You know what I'm saying? So that's that's the I use that word a lot. For myself personally, it's not even a word in a dictionary. This is mm -hmm. I made it up. You know that <laughs> makes any it. sense. Yeah, that's cool. So uplift suasion is 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 is. I just want to see everybody. You know, for me personally, I just want to see everybody meet maximize their potential. Yeah, I'm still working on mine. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I got my I got I got I got my my business for training. I got my business as far as my products. Uh, you know, I'm, you know, some stuff ain't business is be a mentor. Being a being a, big, a father figure, being a being a big brother, yeah, you know what I'm saying. Everybody, so it's so it's it's there's some things that I need to get through, but at the same time, you know, I gotta still reflect on the past a little bit, make sure I stay in touch with that, 
you know, drive forward, forward, and just really appreciate the moment. This is a moment right now. We, we're together sitting here talking. It's a moment right now. Mm-hmm. And I got to focus on our moment. Yeah. In the future, it's going to be the past. You yeah. know what I'm saying? I remember at that time we sat together and we yeah. had a podcast. That's yeah. cool. Right there you go. What you learn out of that? Oh, man. These are things I need to do down the road. You know, yeah. I need to do my own podcast to do this, whatever, that kind of deal. We got, maybe we do this again in a different situation. 100%. You know, but, but, but it's being dynamic and not being stuck. You know what I'm saying? Ali said, if you know, he said, if you if you're the same person ten years from now as you were ten ten years, if you're the same person ten years from now as yeah. you are now, then you've wasted ten years of your life. Yeah, that makes any sense. Yeah, and I think a lot of times, I don't know what the study was, but most people think like the same thoughts, like ninety five percent of the same thoughts yeah. every day. Yeah, so no, for okay. me uh-uh. to hear your yeah. process to get out of that is yeah. is pretty yeah. incredible. Get out of that because you're yeah. you're writing, you're yeah. creative, you're reading, yeah. you're actually connecting with people face yeah. to face you're not yeah. in some dopamine world yeah. all the time yeah i think that's we're not that's we're not, huge, we're not here long enough man yeah we're not here long enough yeah. you'll find i mean there's certain points in your life where things become accelerated um, it takes you forever to go from being born to be 18 years old it feels like it takes forever all of a sudden you get 18 years old and things start to accelerate like major like going you go to if you go to college or you go to trade school what have you you grinding the whole time and everything moves so fast all of a sudden now you're working now when you're working, it gets accelerated because you, you got your routine. You know what I'm saying? All the drama and politics you're dealing with from your work. You know, so it kind of accelerates then. Then, then, you, then you get married or you have kids or whatever, and, and, it, and, it, and it, it kind of slows down a little bit. For me, it slowed down when I had my kids because it's something so brand new to me. And my kids, I'm focused on every little moment of their lives and make sure I'm doing the, do the best I can to raise them. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Make sure they got good clothes, going to decent schools, all that kind of stuff. So you're just concerned about that. Then your kids get older, and all of a sudden, boom, you shoot again. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? At my age, I'm looking at everybody around me at my age, at 40, 50, some years old. Woo, you're getting old. And I'm getting old. I'm looking at pictures of, my, of me sometimes. I'm like, woo. Boy, you're you're things are moving really fast right now. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I, when I was younger, I used to be, oh, I'm hanging around all the old folks. I'm the old folk now. <laughs> that makes any sense? Yeah, yeah. So life is, we don't spend enough time on this planet to take it all in. I don't care how much money, there's places I want to see, people I want to meet, things, are, things I want to do, I will never get a chance to do. Never. You know what I'm saying? Even yeah. with this artificial, the virtual reality, all that stuff, I'm not going to be able to do any of that stuff, man. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I'm not here long enough. There's too many things to do and too many things to say. So what do you do when you, when you, when you want to see everything and want to do everything? You just focus on what you can control. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? A lot of people feel like they, they get anxious. They got to control it. They want to see. They, they, you know, think about it. You just feel like, I'm done. I can't get no better than this. No, everybody, I don't care where you're at in your life, you can always maximize yourself. You can mm-hmm. always expand your mind, expand your horizon expand your reality whatever it don't have to be drugs yeah it don't have to be drinking it don't have to be any of that stuff there's so much i mean we live in the pacific northwest man we got mountains out here we've got the inland sea the puget sound we got the pacific ocean you know we've got two two we've got the olympic mountain range and the cascade mountain range you know we got all this nature in front of us we got the urban stuff that's out here we got everything that you can need and nobody leaves their house yeah there's people that don't leave their house man yeah. There's people that live here and have gone, have, have gone to Mount Rainier, have gone to Olympic Mountains, have done any hiking. If One of the best ways to, to align yourself is just go for it. Close everything out on a Saturday or Sunday. Go for a hike. Go for like a two-hour hike in the woods and, and go out there and try to go just listen to nature. Yeah. Nature has a certain vibration. 100%. Nature has a certain loves you, vibration man. vibration <laughs> that when you get out there, nothing else, all the, all the, all the, all the issues that you deal with go away. Yeah. Because it's that vibration. You know what I'm saying? Yep. 100%. It refreshes you. So when I go out and ride, I go out for a ride. I go hard. You know, I'm breathing. I'm sweating. I'm drinking fresh water as I'm going. And I come back home, and my mind is real clear. I said, these are the things I need to do. I'm going to take care of those. These people I need to call here. Um, I'm going to eat some of this good, healthy food. It's good salad. It's whole protein Whole grain bread. I'm gonna eat real good. I'm gonna replenish my body. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm taking a shower, clean all this stuff off. You know what I'm saying? Get my computer wrong. My, you know, I gotta go check my my Facebook for a second. Boom. Get rid of that. Do that. I'm gonna send a post real quick. I got some th- thought that thought that hit my mind. 
dude, you only got 30 minutes, knock it out. Boom, 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 knock it out. Shh. You know what I'm saying? Sit down with my wife, have a conversation, call my daughter up, call my, sit down with my other daughter. It's just things that everybody I'm dealing with, Tim's at, Tim's, Tim's, Tim's. I'm, see, the thing is, you get rid of all that crap, you become a sponge. You only let good things come in. When you only let good things come in, only good things come out. Love garbage that, in, garbage out. Good things in, gar- good things out. I love that. That makes man. any sense? Yeah. You don't need you don't need no no drugs to do that, man. And there's a lot of people out there. They get they're so caught up, mm-hmm. and they and they they they're they're in like a, a they're they're they're, a loop. they're decompressed in some some in a bomb. They're like a bomb, and they don't know what to do. So they wanna they think this alcohol gonna make it better, or that marijuana shop, the cannabis is gonna make it better. You know, all it does is create guilt, man. It just builds up on people. They know it's not right. Yeah, and and it never gets better when you do that, and it and it and it and it and all of a sudden you get to your place where you become comfortable in that state. Yeah, and your body starts to deteriorate, your mind starts to deteriorate, the way you speak, the way you look at things. All of a sudden now you, now you're sitting there. Now any of us can get sick, any of us can get cancer, but now you're sitting there at the at the end of your time, and it's like you got massive guilt. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, there's people that you didn't have that conversation with. There's there's things that you didn't do places you didn't see because you ain't trying to maximize your potential you settled you settled for this crap that this environment is throwing at us that makes any sense yeah that makes any sense That's deep man you know wow. what i'm saying yeah so you, you get to the point you, you I, I some people say some you know a lot of these athletes i work with to be to be halfway successful or to be great you have to go through failure you can't be afraid of failure you're going to go through it so you get athletes out there saying, oh, you, you, know, you must have a fear of failure. Most of the athletes that I know of that are at a high level have no fear of failure. They've been failed. They had to fail quite a bit to get to where they're at. What I see is that they have a fear of success. Success creates stress and anxiety. You have to be there, and, which, and, it, and, it, and it's tough to be there. Like this person that owns this real estate business right here is under a certain level of stress. That makes any sense? What do you mean? But, but when I mean when I say test. when I say by stress, I'm saying that what happens if, because of the expectation of everybody around them. Because a lot of people do everything not just for themselves, but the people around them. Mm-hmm. It's like how do I look? How do I look to them? What kind of car am I driving? What kind of sh- what kind of clothes I'm wearing? Well, how's my hair? You know what I'm saying? It should be how you feel. But a lot of people walking around worrying yeah. about what other other people think. So, yeah. so what happens if when they're trying to go out and hit hit this high level of achievement, they know that everybody was watching, and if they don't achieve that that high level, then they they need excuses, and they don't want to give themselves the excuse of not getting there. They want to blame everybody else for them not getting there. And so what happens is a person or blame other things. And so what what I what I see is that a lot of athletes self sabotage. It's called self sabotage. So they'll drink, and they'll do lots of marijuana, and do dope, and do drugs. They'll fornicate with everybody they can ever have, and just have a bunch of babies and stuff. Anything that put them in a situation, if they don't get to where they're supposed to go, they have an excuse to not get there. That makes any sense? Yeah. They have an excuse not to get there. It ain't their fault. It's just the alcohol I'm in drinking, or 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 it's the, the three kids I'm trying to support. You know what I'm saying? That I'm not with their mom. It's 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 the you know the marijuana I've been drinking. It's me not training and working out and take care of my body like I'm supposed to. It's me not taking care of my mind like I'm yeah. supposed to. You know all those things. Yeah. But all you, it's not really about you trying to hit. Human beings can't hit perfection. Yeah. You, we're not, we're not, we're imperfect creatures. We'll never be per- perfected. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But we're we're perfect and we're imperfect at the same time. But that perfection, going after that, no. Your job is to do the best you can and see how far you can take it. That makes any sense? Yeah. Not be perfected because we're not going to be perfected. And if people, and when you look at, that's the scary thing about this social media and everything. Everybody's throwing out you, this is a sense of what's perfected. You know, most of the people on social media, that got all them followers, got the, they got issues, man. Mm-hmm. And they're not even at that place where they're showing everybody that they're at. That makes any sense? Yeah. 100%. You know what I'm saying? That makes any sense? They're not, it's, all a big, it's all a big facade. Yeah. Most of the most influential people that I know and, and that I know out there right now, that have a social media, they, they got hardly no followers. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. They got like, oh, you got like 
40 followers, you ain't crap. You got 400 followers, you got you ain't crap. But this person lives in Lake Washington. And they got they got they had businesses. They got they got people got they got people got people that got employed that that making money, taking their families. They they doing huge impacts on our society. They don't have a bunch of followers. Then you got somebody that got 600,000 followers and they just like they ain't got no life. They live in their mama's basement. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That makes any sense. 100%. Now, there's always exceptions to everything. But I'm just telling you that that's not, that's not how we should be judging ourselves, man. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And that was, like, one of the biggest things. The, the one time we talked after we worked out, we were like, man, just to have a conversation face-to-face is, is tough. Yeah. And, and that's what we need most yeah. of the time, not yeah. just to go medicate or, yeah. or to, to push away our problems. Yeah. yeah. Um, obviously, you know, I'm sure you've thought about this topic a lot, but flow to you in terms of optimal experience, yeah. optimal performance. Yeah. And you kind of hit on it a few in a few different ways. You were mm-hmm. talking about being fully present in the moment, yeah. doing things for you intrinsically, mm-hmm. and not being in those lower levels of consciousness. You were yeah. talking about not being in fear of yeah, failure, yeah. Yeah. not feeling that guilt, mm-hmm. not feeling uh, wounded in yeah. terms of like blaming other things. Yeah. So what is your element of flow to you in terms of day-to-day life or for yeah. athletes? Yeah, I mean, for flow for me is, is uh, you know, for me personally, is in the, for other other athletes I work with, um, we have to go about trying to maximize ourselves mm-hmm. in, in in a universal fashion, you know, intellectually, socially, spiritually, um, you know, physically, everything. Just try to maximize ourselves. And when you when you go after these certain segments of what we're trying to maximize, and it allows you to rest on the area, other areas. So if I'm working on my body, it allows me to, to rest my mind, if, uh, intellectually mind, or my spiritual gotcha, self. Yeah. So when I start working on my spiritual self, it allows me to rest my body. You know, it's, it's, you gotta, you got, you get, you always people are like, oh, I, rest, rest, and rest, rest, restoration, recovery is just important as work. Mm-hmm. So you gotta find ways to where you can work on something and hedge and, and, and what I call hedge at certain things and let these other parts you 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 being rest. I agree. So we got to maximize ourselves, and as we contain, as we, as we build ourselves up and and gain this wisdom through adversity and through struggle, then it's important for us to be able to share that with other people. So you maximize yourself. Once you start getting to that place, you start sharing that. When you were a little kid growing up, all of a sudden you started getting good at things, and you started helping your little brother out and helping the younger kids in your neighborhood. Maybe you're the big star basketball player like you were back when you got older, and then you helped the younger kids and help other people, even your own age, even older than you, reach their dreams. So we maximize ourselves and help other people maximize themselves. Now, one area that's really difficult for a lot of human beings, especially high-achieving people, is, is opening yourselves up to help to allow other people to share their gifts with you. Because you start feeling guilty when somebody comes, because you want to bootstrap yourself. You don't want no help. You can do it all by yourself. But we find out in our life, we can't do anything as solo in this life and be successful. 100%. Period. Yeah. So there's always going to be somebody smarter than you. There's always going to be somebody that, that's going to be more expert in certain areas than you are. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Some people that have a certain level, different type of energy that's different than yours. And, and they're going to come to you because they're overfilling with all this all these gifts and all this talent, they don't want to share it with somebody that can that can do something with what they what they what they share. They're, if you're gonna give somebody, you know, some money, you want to make sure they ain't gonna buy no drugs with it. They're gonna buy something to eat. Hmm. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? That's tea, man. That makes any sense? Yeah. So they come to you when somebody comes to you and say, "Will, man, what can I do to help you, man?" You know, they drive up in the Lamborghini, everything's going on. Say, hey, "What can I do to help you, man?" And you go, "I don't need your help, man. I'm gonna I'm gonna get what you got on my own." Cause because because I can, you know what I'm saying? I don't need your help. No, that's a weakness, man. That's a huge weakness. Mm-hmm. If somebody that is qualified to help you and they want to help you, that's what they want to do, man. They got, they're offering you a gift. You, you ever, somebody gave you a gift, you feel guilty that you got the gift? <laughs> that makes any sense? Yeah. Don't be guilty in certain situations. Do not be guilty that a person is giving you a gift when it's sincere and they have something to offer to you because that's gonna that's what they need to do for themselves. They they that's what, That's what helps them out. Yeah. That makes any sense? Yeah. When I'm out there working with young people and stuff, and I'm, I'm giving them everything I got, it's helping me. They think I'm, they think I'm just giving them, and I got nothing left for myself. No, I, no, you understand that that's not how it works out there. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Energy is neither created, it's neither destroyed, it's a continuum of one. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I'm giving you energy, and I'm giving you enough that you're going to give some back to me. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That I can share with other people. 
that can help me go to sleep at night, help mm-hmm. me feel, have that flow within myself. Because, you know, if you're missing out on that, you're not having flow. Mm-hmm. And then, and then for as far as flow is concerned, just to be, now I, I talk to athletes about this, you know, how do you, I talked to, talk to Isaiah about this, Isaiah Thomas. I said, when you're out there, when you scored that 50 points in that game, going through all the stuff that you went through at, with the Celtics, and you scored that, that, those points, what was going on in your head, man? How do you – he did the same thing in high school when he, was, he scored like 60 points in high school in a state championship game. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And shot like 90%. What's going on when that's what's going on? He said and, – and I talked to – you know, I worked with Kevin Durant too. He said the same thing. The high-level athletes, they – you know, like a Kevin Durant, it's all the millions of people watching. Then you got – Massive amount of people in the stadium, in 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 the, in the arena watching. You got a basketball court with some guys that want to just stop you. You know what I'm saying? And you just everything's flowing. And to be in that flow, it's all about preparation. Obviously, you got to prepare yourself to be in that in that state, and you and you have to build yourself to be in that place to even be on that court. But you have to be aware, completely aware, and completely mindful. But in aware 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 in a certain place where Nothing else, nothing else exists but what you got to do. Mm. That makes any sense. Yeah. Nothing else exists but my performance. But you have to be aware. You have to be zoned out. You have to be aware of your 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 body, your mind and your body. People think the mind and the body is separate. They're one and the same. They can't. You can't do one without the other. Really. I mean, yeah, Stephen Hawking didn't have. He couldn't do. He had his mind and and he had he had a disease and whatnot. But in general, your mind and body for an athlete. It's got to be one, you know. Our body is a neur- nervous, our body is a neuro- neuro- neurological system. It's a system. And humans are kind of unique because we got opposing thumbs. We got bifocal vision. We like segways. We stand on two feet and walk around and run and jump and do everything on two legs with no tail. We have nothing to, to, to balance us out. We got to balance ourselves out. Mm-hmm. That makes any sense? Mm-hmm. No other animal, I mean, you got, you got chimpanzees are walking on all fours, basically. They're knuckle draggers. You know, uh, gorillas is higher, you know, they, they knuckle draggers. You know what I mean? But we walk on two legs. We run, we jump, we dunk. You know, we run through holes and stuff like that. You know, we, we climb mountains. The stuff that human beings are capable of doing is pretty amazing. Like, we don't give ourselves enough credit. Yeah. So our mind and our body, got to be aware of that. And the next, next level, we got to be aware of uh, energy. Energy is really important, man. The vibration that we, we emit. And what other people admit, I can tell when somebody got in, when you meditate and you 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 really good with yourself, you can all you can tell when somebody's not feeling right, or their energy's not there, or they're depressed or whatever. You can or when they elate it or when they faking it. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? You can yeah. see, I can, you can if you're in tune, you can see all that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Just as much as a parent can see that in their kid, there's people out there that that work on it so much that they can see it in just regular people. Mm-hmm. That makes any sense? Yeah. So yeah, energy is really important. The energy that we have here. There's a certain amount of energy. To, to feel the energy? Yeah. To actually know it's there? Is yeah. that what you're talking about? Yes. Got gotcha. you. Feel the energy from the people and feel the energy from the environment. Hmm. You know what I'm saying? Feel yeah. the energy from the group of folks out there. That yeah. makes any sense? Yeah. You go to places where you can say, oh, this energy, this is some bad vibration up in here. <laughs> yeah. Then you go to this other place, oh, this is really, it's interesting. This is really, like, I'm attracted to this. Yeah. So the energy that you emit either attracts or it repels. You know what I'm saying? That makes yeah. any sense? Yeah. You know? When I'm training, if I if you come in and work with me, and I don't have the energy to show you, if I don't show you that uplift weights of uplift weights of energy to you, you are gonna come in maybe that time and you're not gonna come in again. You know what I'm saying? I don't market, I don't sell my service, man. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Everything I do is based on my preparation, my my education, my science understanding, and my energy. You know what I'm saying? And what I bring to the table. That makes any sense? Yeah. If I don't bring you into that stuff. You'll come in one day and say, oh, this is garbage, man. I'm not coming in here again. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. If you don't market or sell, you ain't got no business. That's if, 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 you, if you're not really giving everybody every, everything you got at, 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 at all moments. I don't care. I have a group of kids that are like 13, 12 years old coming in, and I'm giving them everything I got. And I'll have a group of guys coming in. They're playing overseas. They're playing in the NBA and whatnot. I'm giving them everything I got. I gave that group and this group the same amount. That makes any sense? Yeah. Some people don't give them the little kids. They, know, they ain't paying attention. They, they're texting, you know. They're griping at them. And then the, the big guys come in. Oh, how you guys doing? What's going on? Come on. <laughs> you know, just kissing everybody's behind. 
Yeah. That makes any sense? No. Yeah. Everybody gonna get the same love. Yeah. That makes I any love sense. That. Yeah. So energy is really important. The next is, no matter where you at, you gotta understand what your what your purpose is. What am I here for? They need to know why you they there for it too. You need to put create a situation where everybody's asking you questions, and they okay, and they're not gonna be, you know, looked down upon for asking questions. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm not the king here. We're working together as a team. We're working together. I'm here to teach you. I'm here to direct you. I'm here to coach you. I'm here to empower you. I'm not here to be your drill sergeant. I'm not here to just tell you what to do and you just do it. You know what I'm saying? Everything we do, I need, I need to explain to you why we're doing it, you know, as best I can. And if I'm not explaining what, you know, what, I, what, what this is going to do for you, don't hesitate to ask me a question why are we doing this, Tim. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So understand what is our goal? What is, what is our purpose? That makes any sense? Yeah. When I came here today, there's a certain, I mean, I'm, everything I'm explaining to you, mind and body, we got to have that when we come in here, right? Yeah. There's a certain amount of energy we got to have when I'm in here. All of us together, me and you working together, talking. Yeah. Then now it's like, what is our purpose here? You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Now the next one is, uh, it's interesting because, because I, I sense, I ain't got to go to church or I ain't got to go to no no monastery. I ain't got to go to no mosque or anything. I just, I have a sense in my heart from, from, from day one, all the toxic stuff I went through when I was younger and then in, in, into all my years that there's something extra going on. The fact that me and you are sitting here face to face having a conversation tells me that there's something extra going on. Mm-hmm. We could just be a couple of plants sitting here just like, you know, just bo- blowing in the breeze. But we're sitting here having a conversation, man. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so we have this we have that big old sun that's up there that emits light and heat. Okay? That's a star. Okay? In our Milky Way galaxy, we got about 200 billion stars. Okay? Sometimes maybe more. It's an estimate. They don't know. Okay? In our in our in our in our known universe, it could be multiverses, we have a, a, approximately 200 billion or maybe more of, of galaxies in our known universe. So if you calculate 200 billion times 200 billion, what's, how many stars is that? Okay? It's a lot okay? of stars. So we're here. We're here. Consciousness, contemplating, communicating, the whole nine. We're a co- conscious culmination of all that. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Do we know of any other life in the universe right now or even in our galaxy or in our solar system? No. no. We haven't found a micro. You know what I'm saying? But we know it's out there, though. Yeah. It's just so damn big and vast that we just can't yeah. get to it. Yeah. We know it's out there. You know what I'm saying? But at the same time, we're here. Um, which means that, that we're very insignificant based on the whole scheme of things. But we're extremely significant. The fact that we're here having a conversation. Yeah. So you know, you look at a dichotomy that's really profound. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Hundred percent. We're not significant, but we're significant at the same time. Yeah. In this enormity. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So that humbles us. We have to be humble. At the same time, we have to be fearless, knowing that everything's gonna be okay. When you're out there going playing hoop and you're going to the rack and this big seven foot guy standing there that's 290 pounds, he's right there and you got to run through him. You can't be afraid. If I'm catching a ball and and a DB is about to blast me, I can't be afraid. You know what I'm saying? If I had to go out in front and speak at at at, at a business conference and it's, it's a thousand people sitting out there and half of them are, you know got some VPs out there, and some executives out, and it's on, I can't be afraid. That's got to be prepared. You know what I'm saying? So, so, but at the same time, we got to humble ourselves. That that you know better than anybody else out there. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? When I walk out here, be a homeless person walking there. I ain't no better than you, dude. I ain't no, you know, you know, lady. I'm not no better than you. You know what I'm saying? Or, or somebody that's driving a Lamborghini and they, they, you know, they got everything in the world going for them. They're on TV and like, you ain't no better than me. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Hundred percent. There's people out there like that though. Yeah. They have everything in the world, and they walk around going, I ain't no better than any of y'all here. I'm just lucky. You know what I'm saying? And for me, based on reference points, there's people that look at me at the same level. You know what I'm saying? It's all ref- it's all relative, man. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. Go to Bangladesh, man. Go go to some place that's really super poor. People living out in, in dumps and stuff, man. You know what I'm saying? And happy. When I went to Africa, man, it blew me away. I went through when I was when I was in uh, uh, in college. And Man, just you talking about? I mean, not Africa as a, as a continent; it's not a country. But I was in, I was in, in Ivory Coast. It's a, it's, it's, 
at extremes. You got extremes of, of, of wealth, and you got extremes of poverty. And I'm, I was, and I had a, a buddy of mine who was on the, on the wealth side, and he was a celebrity of the country. And, but he took me late at night to the hood, you know, where everybody's super poor. And we took a taxi out there, and he wanted to get some goat meat. You know, we went and got some goat meat. He had a bag of, and I said, you know, he loves goat meat. It's like little, little meat chopped up like popcorn. They season it real well. They cook it, and they put it in a bag. Excuse me. No worries. Yeah, I got you. They, they, I got it right there. Oh, okay, perfect. And they put, it, they put it in a bag, and you eat it like popcorn. So he had a taste for that. And so we, we went from the city in, in a five-star hotel, got in a taxi, and drove into the hood. And, and, and I remember him getting out the car, and he's arguing with the taxi driver because the taxi driver didn't want to be there because mm-hmm. his car was going to get ripped off or something. And I'm sitting in the back. He said, Tim, just don't worry about nothing, man. I, I, part of my life in, in my life, I grew up down here, so I'm not afraid of nobody here. I just want to get some goat meat because I want you to taste some delicious goat meat. So I sat down. He left, and, 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 the, and the taxi driver was looking around, just scared. You can see how scared he was. I'm just sitting there. And people walking by, looking in the car and stuff like that. And he comes back. You know, this guy's about ready to leave. He's, he turned the car on, about ready to leave. As he was getting the road, he's, here comes, here, here my buddy comes in and we get in the car and we's eating goat meat. You know what I'm saying? So, so, he, 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 he went from being poor, his dad became a governor, his dad sent him overseas to the University of Paris to go to school. Hmm. He, he uh, ended up running track and he ended up, ended up coming to Washington State and he ended up becoming having a, being a, uh, the first Olympic medalist in his country. So he won a silver medal in, in, in the 400 meters. And, and when you're sitting down, you know, having dinners and hanging out in this, in this country, they got commercials, they got bill, you're on the freeway, you see a bill, bill, big, big, big bill, billboard of him. You're in, the, you're in there watch the TV's on it, every other commercial was him. You know what I'm saying? They milked everything they can out of that. You know what I'm saying? If you had America and no and America never won no medals at the Olympics and that one person won a medal, they'd be way bigger than Jordan, man. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know what makes any sense? Yeah. So so we have to humble ourselves. He was the most humble guy I ever knew, but but you have to humble ourselves at the same time. We gotta we gotta have a certain vainness, not vainness, but 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 confidence in ourselves is what we're capable of doing. Mm-hmm. Because we never we never give 100% ever. I told, like, I tell a lot of athletes, we only give 100% life or death. Most of the time, we don't, we're not dealing with life or death situations, so we're not giving 100%. So we always can do better. You know what I'm saying? We only, we only try to do better so much to the point where it breaks us down. You know? And if it does break it down, make sure it's just temporary where we can build ourselves back up again. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But, but we have to be humble and we have to be confident in ourselves. You know what I mean? And we have to, you know, build ourselves, maximize ourselves, help other people maximize themselves, open up, your, open up yourself to allow other people to help you become, to maximize yourself, to share. Um, we have to be aware of our mind and body. We have to be aware of the energy around us. We have to be um, aware of our goals and our purpose. And we can't be afraid to die. We can't be afraid to die, man. You know what I'm saying? Just do the best we can. If it comes down to that, we, you just know you did the best you can. Everybody else knows you did the best you can. There's no, there's no sad feeling. There's no regret. If that makes any sense. Yeah. Just leave something behind. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Just leave something behind. Don't just take, don't just take, 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 and then try to take it away with you. You know what I'm saying? You know, reciprocate and give, and love, and 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 and, and maximize. You know, so when the time comes, because it will, because it's guaranteed that me and you, as we speak here, aren't gonna be. You here. might not, bro. You know what I'm saying? You might not. No, no, we ain't gonna. <laughs> no, we ain't gonna be here. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I'm very I'm, at, at my age, even even when I was younger, because because I I dealt with certain things, I've seen, I went, I've gone to a lot of funerals. I've seen people die. You know, I've seen people. I, I've seen violence. I've seen those kind of things. I'm very aware of our mortality. You know what I'm saying? So when I'm sitting in front of somebody, I know that it's not it's not these these are moments that you might not ever get, or things might change. I'm very aware of change, so that, that keeps, me, keeps me centered, pretty much. That makes any sense? Change. Keeps me humble, mm-hmm. you know, change. Because it's gonna change. They, things are changing all the time. Yeah. But I do, what I, what I like to do is appreciate 
the change and reflect on the change and and and, and learn from the change. Um, and that's why I, I you know I, I, when I do meditate, because if I go through every house that I, that I grew up with. By the time I get to the, you know, if I lived in, you know, I think I lived in 12 or 13 houses or apartments and whatever you call them. By the time I get to the six or seven, when I fall asleep anyway, so. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so it's like counting sheep. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, yeah, yeah. And I, I learned how to clear my mind. I mean, I went to, um, some of my clients are out in Japan. They invited me out there, and I did some some work, some work out there. And they, a couple of years ago, I went to to. to Kyoto, the most one of the holiest cities, probably is the most holiest city in Asia. Mm. Kyoto, Japan, it's a, it's a city that's almost a thousand years old, man. You know what I'm saying? So I'm yeah. sitting there, I'm sitting in in their their main, um, their main temples area where their highest Buddhist priests are at, and they got buildings there that are made out of wood, beautiful structures. Some some they had one building that was it was it was all made of uh, it was all lined in gold. It was all gold. It was on an island, and it's all gold. You can't even get in there. If you go in there and cross that, get in the water and try to cross in there and even get near that thing, you are not gonna, you're not gonna survive that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You, you, you would get torn to bit, the bits. Yeah. That's how sacred that place is. There were buildings that I'm looking at the wood. Look like they made this stuff last week. 800 years old. Wow. How old is that building? 950. How old is that one? That's 700. America's 249 years old, man. You talking about? You know, way old in our country. I'm just looking at a building that looks like it's so. This building looks pristine. It's made out of wood. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I go to there and 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 I got that one of the gifts that my clients gave me was to spend spend two hours with their highest Buddhist priest to meditate. So I met. He taught me some you know their form of meditation, and he I got zoned out. I got zoned out, and I've learned to take that and use it utilize it with my training. Um, do my physical training. I call it kinetic training, and that allows me to go into meditative state. You what what was saying? what was the practice? How did what what did it include? It's just it's just it's just it's just it's just uh, Zen medit. It's just Zen Buddhism and it's gotcha. meditation. Yeah, you know, they're, they're standard way to meditate, but I've never been exposed to it before. Just in terms of pure equanimity and in what you're experiencing and sensing. It's, just, it's a way of cleansing the brine, the mind. Yeah, and you cleanse the mind to where you have no thought. You have no thought at all, and and. There's nothing. There's nothing crossing your mind. It's just completely, and you know, they actually scientists actually hook your brain up and they look at how the brain reacts to it, and ain't nothing. There's nothing there. And maybe it's certain parts of the brain that that usually are dormant are turned on. So it's it's it, it definitely works. Yeah. Um, I I've learned to do it when I'm cycling. So when I go cycling, it's not for me to just be fit. I'm doing it to meditate, literally. And when I get done, I'm just my mind is clear, and. Um, other forms they do it. I mean, now they're doing it with uh, scientists are starting to do that type of deal with. Uh, they're starting to do it. I didn't bring this up, but they they bring it. They they're doing it with. Uh, uh, they call it uh, mushroom psychotropic type of drugs, you know, uh, P, uh, PCP, LSD, that mm-hmm. kind of stuff. So there's doctors that are starting to research that. They opened it up for research now, because they st- they cut it off back in the back in the fifties and the sixties. They brought in, they're bringing it back because what it's doing is taking people that have major addictions to like heroin and drugs, people that have major uh, depressive issues where they almost suicidal and anxiety issues, and they're going through uh, a controlled scenario, and it makes you hallucinate. It it really it it, it goes after the brain in, in weird kind of ways because the Native Americans do it too. They go in the in the sweat lodge and they'll take mushrooms and they go in there and they'll see everything. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. The past, the future, the present, their elders, their ancestors, their, you know, everything. It takes them to a trip. So you have people that here, doctors here, University of Washington, all the universities are starting to get into it. You go in there, it's all in, in, a, in a situation like this. It's safe. It's highly monitored, and you come out, and the people are coming out, and the issues that they have are completely gone. Hmm. So they could be addicted to, like, smoking or can smoke, uh, addicted to, to heroin or whatnot. They get done with that, and they don't want no heroin anymore. So it's recorded now. I'm not, I'm not giving no BS. I'll find the, the articles that are out there, send them to you, so you know I'm not talking crazy. Mm-hmm. But I do the same thing, you yeah. know, through through my own meditation. Yeah, I clear my mind and get it with all the toxins, 
and the, and the physical aspect of me gets the toxins out of my body. So for me, it, it helps me um, and all the reading and stuff that I do, all the active learning that I do helps exercise my brain. So if you see any youth that I might have at 54 years old, it's because of the way I take care of myself holistically. It's not just exercise. I've seen people that exercise and they become addicted to the exercise. 100%, yeah. And they got so addicted to the exercise and their whole li- other parts of their life was screwed mm-hmm. real bad. Remember back in the bodybuilding era when yeah. guys were in the gym all the time trying to get all buffed out? Yeah. And they were in there like two or three hours a day. Some people were there all day long. Yeah. And their lives were just a wreck. Uh-huh. It makes any sense? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So exercise has never been that way for me. There might be periods of time where it's kind of been, been that way, but it's, for me it's always been the spiritual aspect of exercise. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Even when I ran track and competed, I was doing it not necessarily to compete. I was doing it just just so so I can have some harmony. That makes any sense? Yeah. And I'm, I'm sure there's basketball players out there that, that do the same thing, and football players and baseball players that – that are not really don't even know the score pretty much you know they just feel like there's, there's a sense that i am winning and we won oh we won today oh we won okay cool right on i'm just enjoying this moment here right you know what i'm saying that makes right. any sense yeah you know there's athletes out there that actually you know like michael jordan michael jordan was a competitor so he'll sit down and in, in a track and when they were traveling they play cards he wanted to win everything he wanted to win checkers he wanted to win chess he wanted to win playing cards he wanted to win on the basketball court that's that hyper, hyper aggressive competitive person. Then there's other people out there that's just, just flowing, man. Mm-hmm. They're just gifted and talented, and they're out there having a good time. They really ain't keeping score. 100%. You know what I'm saying? You saw, I think it was a playoff game last year. Somebody out there, remember, got balled out because they didn't know the score? Oh, uh, J.R. Smith? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So that's an example. You know, he didn't know the score because he's yeah. out there just playing because yeah. he enjoyed playing out there. Yeah. Showing out, got a couple of dunks once in a while, some shots <laughs> in. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And it's a playoff game. He didn't know the score. It's a finals <laughs> game. <laughs> no, that's, that's the truth, man. There's no lie. There's people like that, man. I was always, I was one of those guys that, because you know my story now. Yeah. <laughs> when I got into sports, it really wasn't about me trying to win. Yeah. It was me trying to survive and trying to live. Yeah. That makes any sense? Yeah. That makes any sense. That's cool, man. Yeah. Well, that, I really appreciate you coming yeah, yeah, on, man. Good. If you wanted to, uh, I, I have your at name behind you, Tim okay, Manson cool. Training, right but right if you right wanted on. to plug the, the rebar real quick or, oh, yeah, or just yeah. kind of rebar, your, your service. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I got an artificial hip because I, I used to run and play hoop yeah. all my life pretty much. And so um, I've had impingement in my hips. So this hip got beat up a little bit, so I had to replace it. This one's still impinged, but, you know, I remember when I hurdled, I used to trail leg on this one. That probably messed it up a little bit. This one was a lead leg, so I didn't have to worry about that. So I think that's pre- preserved it a little bit. Um, uh, also, I got, uh, you know, just all that running and pavement. You know, asphalt has no give. Mm-hmm. So when you're running on asphalt, and we played hoop on asphalt, they didn't open up no courts for us. We had no AU basketball or nothing like that. We seldom ever played on wood courts because only during the season for three months out of the year. So we played on cement, hard. Mm-hmm. And so my knees, from all the running I did and all the, all the basketball, my knees were kaput. So I got bone on bone, hardly any cartilage. Meniscus is jacked up. I've had four knee surgeries, and I needed knee replacement like, you know, 10 years ago. But I'm okay. I haven't had no knee replacement yet. Um, I can move around. Um, my pain at one point back in the day was like 80%, like real bad. Now it's down to like 20% or 10%, which is tolerable for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the reasons why those things are tolerable and why, why I'm strong, I got full mobility, and I got a lot of my youth in, in the way I move is, is because of the rebar. And the rebar is a, is a, is a, is a it, it has a bar. It's, it's completely compactable. You can, you can take it apart, put it back together again. It's got two bands at the end that you attach to your feet. Bring it above your head. We do, uh, it creates compression. And what that compression does, it, it, it fires up all your intrinsic muscles. And intrinsic muscles are muscles that stabilize joints. So your spine's a joint, your shoulders are joint, your elbows are joint, your wrists are joint, your hands are joint, your knees, your hips, your feet. So it compresses everything. So it kind of creates like an like a artificial um, sense of gravity. So we got certain gravity that we have here, we just add a little bit more push on our bodies. And with that push, 
firing up all the intrinsic muscles, it, we actually do a bunch of exercises, movement exercises, and, 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 and posture exercises, and, and balance exercises, and positioning exercises that allows us to move in a way um, that is healthy. Mm. So when I move, I got uh, some, sometimes, uh, say if I do a squat, I got to mobilize my hips, got to stabilize my back. My shoulders have to be stable and mobile. My thoracic spine has to be able to move. My lower back has to be stable because it leverages my hips. My knees have to be stable. My ankles have to be stable and mobile. So the rebar in its progressive programming allows you, it teaches you how to move in a way that is correct. So it's a corrective exercise tool. A lot of people, when they move, they move incorrectly. They don't know they're doing, they're moving incorrectly, but certain things ain't moving the way, things ain't working like they're supposed to. So you overcompensate mm -hmm. in your movement, and so that causes a lot of injury. So the rebar was designed, you know, for a lot of my athletes, I had some football players out there that could bench a whole lot of weight and squat a whole bunch of weight, but they couldn't hold a 25-pound weight over their head without mm -hmm. their arms going like this because they were so weak in stabilizing their shoulders. That makes any sense? Yeah. So they would cheat in their movements, but if you got a big, powerful body and your primary mover dominant, big muscle dominant, if your intrinsic muscles are weak, those big muscles can damage joints. Yeah. You can damage your shoulder, you can damage your, your spine, you can damage your hip, damage your knees. You can blow your knee, you can, you can roll your ankle too much. So which, which we, what, we, what we need to do is get our intrinsic muscles strong, and that's going to help us leverage our bigger muscles. And that's going to help prove our mobility. And if you work with the progressive programming, like flexibility working like that, you can actually start to move a lot better. Yeah. So as you get older, you start to lose your balance. You start to lose your body awareness. You start to lose your mobility. If you continue to work with the rebar, you'll be able to maintain that youthful mobility for, the, for you know, until you die pretty much. Love it, man. Once you're healthy. So well, I mean, as, me. as you know, I trained with Mike Knight, and yeah, yeah, that yeah. was a couple times we we do it before. I'm playing the yeah. best D in my life. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. definitely yeah. recommend going to yeah. check it out. But yeah. it's, it's a unique product. It's nothing, yeah. out, it's nothing out there in the marketplace yeah. that does this, especially yeah. with the programming. So it's not a – what people people think, look at it, so it's an open chain. I can do curls. and We can do a little bit of that, but that's not what it's designed for. Yeah, yeah, it's really yeah. designed to, to fire up your intrinsic muscles and you actually move while those muscles are being fired, and it helps you – Moving a way that's that's healthy way of moving. That Love makes any man. sense. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming on, man. Thank I mean, you. just an unreal amount of wisdom that I'm oh, looking you, man. forward to. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm just uh, confiding my whole life to you, man. <laughs> no, man, I love yeah, it. Give you so, a little sample of it. I appreciate it. But I give you all the details. There was there was a lot of times where you, you throw something out. I'm like, oh god, I, I'm trying to think through it as you're talking. I'm like, nope, be present, be present. So yeah, I look yeah, forward yeah. to yeah. to editing this up and, yeah. and really sinking in yeah, to yeah. what you spoke about. So yeah. Yeah. appreciate you coming on, man. And, Thank you guys for tuning into the Flow Station podcast. If you enjoyed it, please rate it, share with your friends, and uh, follow us on Instagram at Flow Station Podcast or Twitter at The Flow Station. Um, more content on the way, more guests, and uh, more flowing to do. Appreciate you guys. Have a good one.